Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nick Burns. I'm a professor here at the Kennedy School. I want to welcome all of you, our students, our faculty, our dean, our great dean, Doug Elmendorf here. Uh, we're going to discuss a very serious subject today. We're going to discuss it in a civil, open, tolerant manner. And that subject is one that has roiled this university, roiled our state, our country, and has had global ramifications. It's the executive order signed by President Trump on immigration and on refugees. And we have a terrific panel to discuss these issues today. Let me introduce them to you. David French is a staff writer for the National Review, and David was good enough to fly up from Washington, D.C. to be with us. He's a senior fellow at the National Review Institute. He's an attorney. He concentrates on constitutional law. He's a, a veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom. He's a former major in the United States Army. He's also an author. He's written a best-selling New York Times book, Rise of ISIS, a threat that we cannot ignore. So we're very pleased to have David with us today. My very good friend, Julia Kayam, fellow professor here at the Kennedy School, really probably doesn't need an introduction to this audience, but let me introduce her to you. She's a faculty member here, one of our most popular professors. I supported her when she ran for governor of Massachusetts, and I hope she goes back into electoral <laughs> politics, not to put any pressure on you, Juliet. She is a founder of one of the few female-owned uh, owned security uh, businesses in the United States, and I have read, and I hope you will read, her book, Security Mom, An Unclassified Guide to Protecting Our Homeland and Your Home. That's Juliet Kayam. Gil Kurlikowski is a senior uh, fellow here at the Institute of Politics. He's just arrived at the Kennedy School. Gil was commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection under President Obama. The Customs and Border Protection was formed as part of the Department of Homeland Security when it was uh, initiated in 2003 as a result of the 9-11 attacks on the United States. So Gil had national responsibility for defending America's borders but also for facilitating trade and, and travel to the United States. He oversaw 60,000 people in that process every day. Uh, and of course, he is someone with an extraordinary background in law enforcement. He had been President Obama's coordinator for uh, national drug control policy at the White House before he became in charge of the borders. He was chief of police for nine years in Seattle, chief of police in Buffalo, New York, long-time career in law enforcement, so we couldn't have a better person to help us think through some of the implications of this executive order. And finally, our other good friend from the Harvard Kennedy School faculty, Moshe, Professor Moshe Temkin. I think we started at the Kennedy School the very same day, uh, and that was in September. That was a great day. In September 2008, Moshe is an associate professor of history and public policy here at Harvard. He had taught in Paris and at Columbia University previously. He's a specialist on the history of the modern United States. He's particularly interested in the interaction between Americans and non-Americans. And he's currently um, writing a book uh, on the phenomenon of, with a provisional title, Undesirables, Travel Control and Surveillance in an Age of Global Politics. I think you can see from these introductions that we've got a a group of people here who can help us think through a very complicated and very emotional issue. I wanted to refer to you a, a, pub, a letter that our dean wrote to all of us in our community and just put on our website a couple of hours ago. I think it's a guide for how we might understand this issue, both in its global and national impact, but also the impact here at Harvard Kennedy School. And it's the second such letter that Doug has written to us over the past week, and I, I admire him for this, and I, I, I would suggest to all of our students especially, but other members of the community, to read Doug's uh, letter. And if um, he didn't plan to speak today, but obviously if someone wanted to ask him a question about that, we'll pass the mic to our dean um, with alacrity. Here's how I'd frame the issue for our panel discussion. It goes to the heart of America's relationship with the rest of the world. Who do we admit as visitors to the United States? Who do we admit as immigrants to the United States? Who do we admit as refugees to the United States? And just so we all have some common facts, because we believe 
in facts at the Harvard Kennedy School and in data. Here is what, the, what President Trump's executive order mandated. The suspension of refugee admissions from all over the world for four months. A reduction in refugee admissions in 2017 from a ceiling of 110,000 to 50,000. It blocks all refugees from Syria indefinitely. It suspends all visitors of any kind from seven countries, Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. Um, a note on that, a, a lawyer for the U.S. government in federal court in Virginia this morning said that in addition to that, uh, 100,000 visas that had been issued to foreigners from these seven countries had been revoked. The State Department then followed up and said that was an incorrect number, that it was slightly less than 60,000 visas of citizens from these seven countries were revoked as a result of the executive order. President Trump also decreed that Christian and other minority religions be granted priority over Muslims, and some are calling this the Muslim ban. President Trump and his supporters defend these actions. They say that the refugee system in particular is broken, that it needs an urgent review, that our borders are porous, and that securing our borders is the number one priority of the United States government, thus the suspensions and thus the review of both refugee, visitor, and immigration into the United States. The detractors of this decision, both domestic and foreign, I would conclude say this, that the system is not broken, that we've taken in under, just under 800,000 refugees since 9-11 with very few problems, that we already have an extreme vetting process. It takes 24 to 36 months to be reviewed as an intending refugee to the United States. Some say this may give a propaganda advantage, a question I'll ask Juliet, to some of the terrorist groups. And I would refer to you to an article, a column that David Brooks wrote in the New York Times this morning. He sees it as part of a larger effort, in essence, to withdraw the United States from a leadership position in the world. You've seen the commentary. We're going to discuss two important and distinct but related issues. Issue one. Was this the right policy decision for the United States? Issue two, is it being implemented effectively? Now, um, I, I don't want to saddle David, who's going to speak to issue one, with having to own up to number two, but we'll <laughs> discuss that question. One thing is for certain. There's been a major disruption for tens of thousands of travelers coming to the United States. I think it's objectively true that the image and credibility of the United States has been fundamentally impaired by this decision. It's affected our community. We have Arab students here who've been turned around with valid visas, student visas, who've been studying with us for more than a year, who were turned around at Logan Airport and sen sent back to their point of origin. It's caused a lot of stress in our community. I'm faculty chair for the Middle East, and we've heard from our faculty and our students about how this has disrupted their lives. Harvard University this morning joined seven other Massachusetts universities in filing an amicus brief challenging this executive order, and so that's another bit of news for us today. So that's the background. That's what we intend to do. I'm going to ask each of our panelists a question, maybe a follow-up, and then we'll turn to you for your questions. We always do that. There are four microphones, two in the floor, two in the balconies. We'll call on people sequentially. And let me just, for those of you asking questions, please give us your name, uh, and please make sure there's a question mark attached to the end of your question or your statement. So let me ask the first question of David, and David, we welcome you here today. You're an expert in this subject. You've been writing about this subject this week. Tell us why you support the executive order and why you think that, that the criticism, uh, you say, has been exaggerated and overblown. Well, well, first, thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor to be here on the stage with people who've rendered some incredibly valuable service to the United States, not just in government, but also through their scholarship and expertise. So it's an, it's an honor to be here, and I appreciate the invitation very much. Um, to answer that question, and I think support is a strong word, uh, I think it's really just a baby step. 
uh, in, in, in a direction of an overall security policy change, and overall security policy changes that we need in the United States. I don't think it is in the grand scheme of things when we look back on the years of the Trump administration that this will have been as significant an event as we are saying that it is now. And let me back up just a minute. Um, thanks in, in large part to the work of Bush administration officials since 9-11, to Obama administration officials uh, after the Bush administration, including people on the stage, we have been mercifully and blessedly free of the massive spectacular attack like we saw on 9-11. Uh, that was the signature form of a terrorist violence that Al Qaeda had started to perfect. They were, blew up embassies. My goodness, they almost sank an American warship. An American warship hadn't, hadn't been sunk in decades and Al Qaeda almost did it. They hit us harder than Nazi Germany ever did. Um, at every bit as hard as Imperial Japan did on, on, uh, at Pearl Harbor. But that has been um, through an awful lot of literal blood, sweat, and tears, we have defended our nation from that kind of attack since that time. What we have seen, however, is that the enemy always gets a vote. The enemy knows and, and evolves and understands and learns how to change tactics. And one of the ISIS innovations has been to, exception with the obvious exception of the pretty complex Paris attack, to try to attack in ones and twos and threes, to try to inspire attacks, to try to infiltrate. And what we have seen just uh, in the numbers is a, is a pretty big ramp up in the number of attacks and plots in the United States since the rise of ISIS, since it blitzed across the Iraqi border in the summer of 2014. Uh, depending on what measure you're going to look at, between two to three times as many plots executed and disrupted in the last couple of years. So there's an escalating threat environment. Uh, in that escalating threat environment, with the reality also that when you deal with terrorists who've had safe havens, at this point now, sometimes for up to two years in cities, um, that there is often a lag time between the emergence of the safe haven and the actualization of the terror threat. Given that reality, I thought it was entirely prudent for a Trump administration in an escalating threat environment to hit a pause button for a short time. This uh, 90 to 120 day. The 90 day pause button in particular. Yeah. Now these seven countries, I'm sure you've heard this, these are seven countries that were identified during the Obama administration as being countries of concern. I think the list might be over-inclusive to the extent it includes Iraq and under-inclusive to the extent that it doesn't include some uh, Pakistan, uh, to the extent it doesn't include, for example, immigration from regions in uh, Russia that have directly impacted this community, for example. Um, but I think it's a defensible list. Uh, do I think that this is going to make, a, make America safe again, as Donald Trump uh, trumpeted as he signed it? No, I do not. Uh, I don't think, I think it is a, a small step. The 50,000 number with the refugees brings the number of refugee admissions into a number that's slightly above the average for the eight years of the Obama administration. It's below the average of the first seven years of the Obama administration, but not by a whole lot. It's only in this it last 70, year. 70,000, I think. In, in the last year, it went up to about 110,000. Yeah. Um, so, that's not a number that's out, out of line with post 9-11 norms. All the hard work is gonna come forward. What happens after the 120 days? What happens after the 90 days? And to anyone who thinks that an immigration policy alone will make America safe again is deluding themselves. This is an incredibly difficult challenge. One of the, one of the quickest ways after my own experience in the Middle East uh, to discern whether somebody knows what they're talking about when talking in the Middle East is if they say, well, here's the answer. Um, it's incredibly difficult. Uh, my concern is I don't know that, that, uh, that the very top of the Trump administration underappreciates the difficulty and the complexity of it, and that's a concern. But I'm, very, I'm mainly interested in what happens after the 90 days, what happens after the 120 days. David, if, um, if part of the rationale here is to keep intending terrorists out of the United States, why not Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and Russia? We were attacked in this community in 2013 by two young men of our community. They came originally with their family from Russia. Uh, the 9-11 terrorists, 19 of the 21, mm -hmm. were from Saudi Arabia. 
Pakistan has virulent terrorist groups in its soil. What, if, if that's the part of the rationale, as I listen to President Trump, why not those countries? Well, that would be one of my criticisms of it. Uh, I think that there should be a pause from what I would call jihadist conflict zones or areas where there is a, a high degree of jihadist activity. And so I do think in that sense that ban, that 90 days, is under-inclusive. Uh, there are parts of Pakistan where I sincerely doubt the ability of people to, uh, of, our author of authorities to adequately vet people who come from certain areas of Pakistan. Um, I, you know, I know that through multiple administrations, Saudi Arabia has been classified as an ally. I don't believe that. Um, and so I, I, I think that's a legitimate in, in, criticism that it is under-inclusive, and I do think it's under-inclusive to the extent that it leaves some jihadist conflict zones under the pause and others not, and, and I think that that's an issue. Another quick follow-up. Okay. Can't resist. Um, the moral base of, uh, basis of American power. You defended us in Iraq. You're a soldier. You're a constitutional lawyer. We applaud you for that. So you're a perfect person to answer this question. How are other people going to see us? We're an immigrant nation. We're a refugee nation. We always have been. Does it bother you that now the clear implication overseas, as we all read the press, is that the United States is retreating in its values? Well, let me, there's, I think those are two separate issues, and this is, I might step on your toes here on what you're going to say. So how do, say, our Western allies view us, or how do allied governments, say, like the Parliament of Iraq right now view us? And I do think that it, there is a real cause for concern that our, some of our allied governments are, are going to be frustrated in dealing with us, the Parliament of Iraq frustrated in dealing with us, and, and I think that is one of my issues with the inclusion of Iraq on the list. We're in the middle of a critical battle in Mosul. We are relying on, uh, on Iraqi boots on the ground to win that battle. This seems like the wrong time to mess with the relationship with Iraq, and I have a problem with that. Then there's the larger question about what do the jihadists think about us. Look, we have been through jihadists or potential jihadists. We've been through now seven administrations since the Shah of Iran. Seven with widely different approaches to, a, uh, to terror, with different uh, manners of dealing and mannerisms and different uh, ways of dealing with the, the, the uh, Middle Eastern Muslim world. And yet consistently through seven administrations, we have faced the threat of jihadist terror. And it grew during the Clinton administration. It grew during the Bush administration. It grew in some ways during the Obama administration. At this point, we're dealing with people who hate us for reasons beyond our executive orders. When Osama bin Laden talked about um, the reason for the 9-11 attack, one of the things he mentioned was the, you know, the reconquest of Spain from the Muslim, uh, from, from the Muslim world in 14, was completed in what, 1492. We didn't have anything to do with that. Um, and so there is a long-standing theological historical grievance that any given executive order or drone strike or raid doesn't move the needle on. Thank you. Thank you, David. Gil, I want to turn to you, since you have so much authority on this issue, and the question I want to ask you is, was this necessary? And I would just ask it in this fashion. I was a young uh, diplomat 30 years ago interviewing intending refugees in the Middle East and in Europe, and even 30 years ago, we knew everything about these refugees. And we took years to interview them, Interpol, intelligence, secure, law, law enforcement, background investigations. Do we, is the system broken? Are refugees presenting some kind of a security or criminal threat in large numbers? And how do you balance that versus the value <coughs> of our multi-ethnic nation taking in refugees? So Nick, I think that's the crux of, of this issue. Uh, since 9-11 and the 9-11 Commission and two presidential administrations, there has not been anything involving air travel, cargo, passengers, uh, passports with uh, biometric information. There hasn't been any program that hasn't been rethought, changed, tweaked, improved upon, et cetera. And so to make a change in this and to say, look, we're going to hit a pause button on these seven countries. The difficulty I think I have is one, it's pretty unclear to me that something is broken. And having led a couple uh, big city law enforcement agencies, 
one of the things that you always look at is if you issue a policy that says effective immediately, you should really rethink that policy. <laughs> you don't issue at 443 on a Friday a complex policy to 60,000 badge wearing armed, the largest federal law enforcement agency that we have, issue it and say effective immediately because it sends up every kind of warning. What do they know that we don't know? Is there an emergency? Is there a crisis? And how do you answer that? Uh, and so I, I, I think most of my concern is much more about implementing policy in the way you treat it, a very large and complex federal law enforcement agency who really is the front end. I mean, they are the first people uh, that when you come to this country, and so if you're a citizen and you come back in, we want that Customs and Border Protection officer to do their job to protect and to make sure that someone isn't going to harm us. We also want them to say, welcome home. If you're coming here for the first time or you're coming from another country where you live, we want to say, welcome to the United States. You can still do your job. This policy and the way it was implemented and the, and the lack of, of training and, and programmatic effects really put them in a very difficult situation. And the last thing I'll touch on there is that you really want to build some level of communication and trust. I cannot tell you how many times we thwarted or interdicted a, a particular threat because someone gave us information. They saw that person as someone that they could talk to or someone that they could trust or something that they heard. Gil, um, there's so many questions. I'm sure you're gonna get a lot of questions from our audience. Um, as you thought about how to best secure our borders, that was your job, your most recent job before you, did, you helped mm -hmm. us on narcotics. Were refugees in the front line of your concern as posing a security risk to the United States? I, I used the, the stat of just under 800,000 800, refugees right. since 9-11. I've seen two different numbers. Some people say there have been 12 refugees engaged in criminal activity. Some people say 34. They're small. But again, the, the president has the responsibility to secure the borders. How, where is the cost benefit here? So, so everything we do in Customs and Border Protection, we get 70,000 containers a day, those great big huge containers. We don't open 70,000 containers and look inside them. We get a million passengers every single day that come into the United States. You're not going to send a million people to secondary and interview them, et cetera. It's all based upon risk, it's all based upon information, and that's the best way to go about it. So if you were to tier who is a particular threat, refugees are in that tier and should be, and, and should be carefully reviewed, but remember the refugee system is one in which it takes quite a few years for somebody to get through that process. So there are other threats and there are other concerns, and as Jim Comey at the FBI also uh, uh, remarked, uh, the, the thing that also keeps him up at night is somebody coming right from within the United States that has become self-radicalized. Do you, do you assume that after this four-month four period where the review is in place that we'll resume processing refugees, resume take in 2017, or do you think there may be a longer ban on refugees? Well, I, you know, if you were going to review all of the steps that are taken, and there's fingerprinting, photographing, if you go through the process for claiming refugee status, you know, it's a good 18 months to two years. And you're not coming directly oftentimes from Syria. You've already been sitting in a camp for one or two or three years uh, before, and this is what Canada has done, before you're ever, uh, uh, ever admitted to the United States. And until the plane lands with you on the plane, you are continuously vetted against a variety of databases, against information, et cetera. Not that those databases are, are always, can be the most accurate, uh, especially when you're dealing with, uh, with data from, uh, from a foreign counterpart. But the process is very thorough right now. If it's going to be improved upon, if it's going to be tightened, uh, and there are ways to do that uh, uh, lawfully, then they should be looked at. If you were advising President Trump today on the greatest security threat that can come across our borders in any way, shape, or form, what would you, how would you prioritize? Well, first I would go back to the self-radicalized and the people that are right here. I mean, over and over, the number of threats, the number of assaults, uh, the number of actually horrendous crimes that have been committed in the name of terrorism 
have been done from somebody right here in, in the United States, nobody that came, across, uh, that came across the border. But the second part that I would, uh, do, uh, that I would look at is certainly can we add additional layers of security uh, at our ports of entry, particularly our uh, uh, ports of entry where we don't have an awful lot of people. If you come in through LAX or JFK or Miami, we have, we have literally hundreds or even thousands of employees there. If you cross from Canada at the port of Raymond, Montana, there may be one employee there. Uh, we should probably look at some of those other ports of entry also to make sure that they have the resources and to make sure that they have the technology. Thank you very Thanks. much. Juliet, you're a security expert. You've been a Homeland Security official both for the Commonwealth but also for the federal government. You've written books about this. You live and breathe this. What do you think of the executive order? Right, wrong, it's a complex issue. Yeah. Um, and thank you, and, and thank you all uh, uh, for being here. Uh, because of the hastiness, I think, of the executive order, which we will all agree, unfortunately, I, I will be sneaking out at about 5.10. I was not able to clear out the entire time, so I uh, want to just let people know I'm not mad at David, um, <laughs> uh, if you're worried about that. Um, uh, uh, so um, it's a great question, and I, the students in my class will know, I think every counterterrorism effort, every Homeland Security effort has to be judged against three criteria, which is what animates the way I think about it. Does the policy uh, minimize um, uh, risk? Second, does it maximize America's defenses? And third, does it maintain our spirit as a nation, who we are? Uh, and every, you know, and e the most conservative person, right, will say, you know, will say, well, you know, I want to get on the New York public transportation system very quickly and get from point A to point B. Uh, therefore, you can't have mu that much more security on it. We are vulnerable by design. And so the question of what we're doing with our counterterrorism and homeland security efforts is, how do we minimize the risk and get our vulnerability lower? Because we're not going to get it to zero. You're not, right? And so that's where you know, the Homeland Security apparatus of response comes into play, because you're never going to get it to zero. And so it's sort of a mythology to think, well, if we just um, you know, do a machete on this group of people, um, that, the, that that's going to have an impact on, figuratively, not literally, it's going to have an impact on, um, uh, on the risk that we have. So, I just, so by those three criteria, this executive order uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, pass the test, at least from what, where I, I come from. Um, just picking up on uh, Gil's point, um, the risk of terrorism in this country, and this is, this is a good thing, people, like this is good, right, is that it is, tends to be homegrown. Why is that a good thing? Well, for one, because these are members of our society, we have ways in which we can try to uh, reach out, try to de-radicalize or identify radicalization. And we don't have generations of men um, who are traveling to Syria, thousands coming back, and trying to kill their citizens, unlike France and a lot of Europe. This is a good thing. Now, why is that? There's a lot of explanations. One is, you know, we have a very integrated Muslim and Arab community here. We have oceans. It's helpful. You can't drive from Boston to Damascus. Um, uh, but I think part of it is that the Arab community, the Muslim community, which I'm, I'm part of the Arab community, this is sort of feels like, you know, we kind of are doing pretty well here, right? And so the more that you uh, might do things that might be viewed as isolating the threat, which is, let's just be honest here, is the, is the homegrown threat, um, the more you put at risk a whole, you know, series of issues around, um, uh, 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 around counterterrorism. The second is, um, I think it's important to note what, in fact, the Trump administration did, because there's a narrative out there uh, that this is exactly, or this is what Obama did, and you alluded to at least the seven countries. So this story begins, I had to write down the date, begins in 1986 when the United States decided that um, we would have what's favored and unfavored countries. Every country has favored and unfavored countries. In this country, we have favored and unfavored travelers. Those of you who have TSA pre-clear are, are favored. This, distinctions like that shouldn't keep you up at night. There's favored and unfavored countries for a variety of reasons. Um, and we started the visa waiver program. It now has 38 countries. None of them are, are majority Muslim countries, admittedly. Um, after Paris in 2015 was, and Gil, and Gil was there at the time, that was when, as consistent of any nation that has to constantly be revising its immigration and visa standards, 
That was when the Obama administration says, okay, these seven countries, looks at the threat and says, we have a problem here. We're letting Brits in, we're letting uh, French in, we're letting um, Germans in under visa waiver. We have no idea who they are because we thought Germans were okay and we thought the French were okay. Well, it turns out in this world, there are homegrown, you know, there are French nationals who um, are a real risk. And so that's where the seven countries came from. It just said simply, if you have a visa from those countries, uh, we're gonna take a second look. You don't get exempt if you've traveled uh, to one of those seven countries. So a Brit, to make it clear, if a Brit who traveled to Syria would not be able to get the waiver. That's important to note because that's the kind of refined visa, uh, immigration, uh, migration policies that we need to have because we will all agree that no system put into place in you know, 2001 should maintain itself in 2017. So on those issues, yes. And then the, the, I think it, it has not made us safer and less safe. And I just want to end with the narrative. Look, ISIS is, I, I can't explain ISIS, right? You know, in the sense, what's gonna motivate them? There is a narrative out there that this has, you know, ISIS as it loses on the ground now has a new narrative, make ISIS great again, right? That they have now taken this as a way of pushing out a narrative. I will say the last two administrations, Republican and Democrat, has spent a lot of time ensuring that even the most draconian of counterterrorism efforts, and which I'm sure a lot of you in the audience wouldn't agree with Gil and I and others on, on, on how we've enacted this, um, uh, were not perceived as a war against a religion. And the carve out in this executive order for minorities and majority states, let alone what Trump has said, what Giuliani has said, I think makes it hard to maintain a narrative that I think we have to maintain uh, because we need moderate Arab states to help us in this war and because the Europeans, for example, have a much different problem uh, than we do. So overall, based on the criteria I think are important for an effort that will last many decades ahead, I think this, this fails. Ju um, Juliet, uh, two quick follow-up yeah. questions. The first is this, Pr to give President Trump his due, his most solemn responsibility is to defend the country. He's obviously taking that very seriously, as he should. Um, he also presides over a country which on an existential basis is an immigrant and refugee country. So if you're an American in this audience, we're all immigrants or refugees. And there is a, not just a tradition, but there's a value there that we are multi-ethnic, multi-racial, and that we come from all over the world. If you suspend it, even for 120 days, and then threaten to suspend it further against certain religions, how do you, as a policymaker, yeah. deal with those two very important priorities as the President of the United States? Well, I think, um, and, I, and I agree, you know, look, the solemn duty to protect and defend, I mean, we, we've all lived it, and David has certainly fought for it. So, um, and, uh, uh, and so that, that is key. I think, though, that's just, you know, th that doesn't tell you anything, especially at a school of public policy, about what is the nature of that protect and defend. Because uh, bumping up against any security apparatus or any security policy is going to be other demands of a nation like ours. On a nation like ours, I always tell people, look up right now, right? There are a, almost a million people up in the air domestically right now. Think about that, right? What that means in terms of flow and transportation and security and all these different aspects. And we got to keep that moving even if your solemn duty is safety and security. So what, uh, what any policy needs to do is to take safety and security seriously, admit that the responsibility of government is certainly to minimize those vulnerabilities, but it takes all of us, community members, and. Um, but also recognize that, that a security policy that then is so counter to an important narrative for Americans um, and for who we are uh, may not be worth the, the it, I would say, the, the non-existent threat of this class that have been harmed. When you ask me, are we safe or not, I do worry about something like this for the Arab and Muslim community in the United States. I think that and you're a part of that community. Yeah, and I think I'm, I'm Arab Christian, um, and uh, uh, and um, and the, the the escalation of a sense that this is a Muslim, not Muslim thing. Um, there's six million, six almost six point something million uh, Muslims in America, citizens, um, let alone all the visitors. I do think also that this sort of 
ratchets up a, a concern, and I think that community is rightfully, not only angry, I think because of some of the issues, have, but rightfully concerned about whether this might animate a sense of us and them, which we have been incredibly, this is where I say I'm a, I'm a happy news person, this is a good news story for America. We don't have the problem that France has right now or that um, Germany has. We've been really good in, you've been really good in taking my people and you know, making us like totally American, as I say like, as I say that, but that's a good thing. <laughs> so uh, second, last follow up. We instituted a visa waiver program. You referred to yeah. it over the last 25 years. So citizens of France, Germany, Britain entered the United States without a non-immigrant visa. Is that gonna go away now? So, Will Congress repeal visa waivers? So there was a hint of it after Paris. You guys can't understand what it means for us to grant visa waiver because it means for, for US citizens in the room, this is why in your dreams when you have that romantic vacation in Paris with your loved one on, you know, on a Friday and you surprise them, it doesn't happen, I know, but that you can go to Paris um, on the weekend. Because um, we don't have to apply we don't have to, to do their that. countries. They're, it's mutual. So yeah. one of the reasons why we've never reformed it is the sense by the business community, by students, by everyone, that there's, this is no way to run a country, right? That we have so many people traveling back and forth for good reasons, for the, you know, the movement of people and goods and ideas that make this country great, that that is, uh, is, is not allowable. There was, and I don't think, I think it will, I, I cannot imagine, given that there's no threat, you know, just through, not, there's a threat, persistent threat, but um, uh, that absent something quite large happening here, that that uh, detente between us and those visa waiver countries won't hold. There is a part of the executive order that reformed a small part of the visa waiver program um, that some people who do go back and forth will now have to be interviewed. That was waived. That will be a burden on a large part of the business and student community. But I, absent something happening here, um, I can't imagine it. Thank you. But I've been so wrong. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Moshik, give us some wisdom. You've thought deeply no, about no. these issues, and I'd frame I'm not it. the right guy for that. You're the right guy for it. And I would frame it this way. We've had an historic tension. It's in our national DNA. Are we, are we engaged in the world? Are we isolated from it? Hamilton, engage. Jefferson, isolate. Lindbergh, isolate. FDR, engage. We have that right now in our national dialogue. Just turn on the television, right. the television set. Is, do you see these measures as a break or as a continuation of this big debate over 240 years as to who we are and how we relate to the rest of the world? Right, good. Thanks, Nick, for inviting me. So we've been talking about a lot of things, security, uh, immigration, refugees, um, those all have different histories. I will, say, I will say this, as you pointed out, Nick, just now, uh, the, the history of this country is a history of immigration and immigrants, very much so, at least for the you know, past 200 years. Um, immigrants built this country. Uh, immigrants are, as you pointed out, in many ways would make this country great. It depends how you define great, the way I define it is makes it a place where people want to come. They want to come here to study. They want to come here to work. Uh, they want to come here uh, even for the reasons of simply liking uh, American culture, American society. They're looking forward to watching uh, the Super Bowl on Sunday, right? Just as much as uh, you know, U.S. born, uh, you know, U.S. born people are. Uh, at the same time, uh, the history of uh, anti-immigration is also almost as old as our country. Uh, there has always been um, a strong anti-immigration impulse in the United States. It has a long and complicated history that I can't uh, go into Including detail now. Including here in Massachusetts with the know-nothings. Especially here in Massachusetts, well into the 20th century. Uh, and the, you know, the examples are many. We had in the 1870s the China Exclusion Act. Uh, we had later on um, especially in the 1920s, really a shutdown of immigration from uh, places that were considered then undesirable, uh, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, Asia. And the opening only happened in, in the 1960s. Of course, that shutting down of immigration in the 1920s led to a major uh, refugee problem uh, during the Second World War, when this country was closed uh, to immigrants, not to immigrants, to refugees uh, who couldn't get in. Many of them wound up uh, dead uh, 
in genocide. So that history, uh, I think, is being, to some extent, uh, relived now, and ex sort of in, in a new and slightly bizarre uh, iteration. Um, I will say this about the previous sort of, that's the continuity part maybe, the, 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 and, and that anti-immigration impulse, I should add, and this is going to sound maybe unpleasant to a lot of people, has always had a strongly racialized component. Okay? That was the case in the 19th century, it was the case in the 20th century, it was targeted at particular uh, populations that were considered to be then sort of unassimilable, undesirable, right? They couldn't adopt to the American way of life. And it should be said, also considered in many cases dangerous. So at the start of the 20th century, we had, um, including here in Massachusetts, in New York City and other places, we had terrorism. We had terrorism that was often, not always, but often conducted by people who had come uh, from some of these countries. It led to so-called Red Scare, first Red Scare, and mass deportation of people, and then closing of, uh, of the doors. Uh, so there's always been some correlation between security fears, genuine security fears having to do with things that happened, and a more overall general perception of a danger that a particular group of people from a particular origins uh, represent. Where I see the break now, and I'm kind of struggling to understand how to fit this into the history, at least in the 1920s, you know, grotesque and draconian as that shutdown was, it was in response to uh, acts that were committed by people that you could point they came from such and such countries that were closed. If I understand correctly, in the seven countries that have been closed down in the past 40 years, there's not been a single terrorist attack in the United States, at least that I'm aware of, committed by anyone from those seven countries. So I'm a little suspicious when I think about it in historical perspective. Then I look at the list of the countries that are not closed to coming to the United States. And I actually can't say there is a, a religious test because there are Muslims from other countries who are not included in this ban. They come from countries, you mentioned some of them, Saudi Arabia and others, and I'm starting to wonder, well, what is the difference between Saudi Arabia and, let's say, Somalia or Syria? Well, it seems to me, and if you look at the statements made by the current president while he was campaigning, if you look at the texts and statements made by the person who is now one of his closest advisors and seems to be, in many ways, the most powerful man in the country at the moment, this is Steve. that there is a... Steve Bannon. Thank you. I didn't want to say the name, but thank you. I thought we should. It seems to me <laughs> that there is a particular worldview here regarding Muslims. It's not that all Muslims are going to be banned. It's Muslims that may be in need. Muslims that are in crisis. Muslims that need our help. Muslims that pose supposedly a risk in terms of our uh, economy, in terms of in theory, maybe jobs, uh, people's own wealth. Uh, we have a lot of business with Saudi Arabia. So there are Muslims that contribute to our coffers and Muslims that don't contribute to our coffers. It seems to me that, that that's at least the distinction that I'm seeing if I have to put it in, in historical perspective. Let me ask you a follow-up on that point. At the beginning of the Syrian civil war in 2011, the United Nations said there were about 22.4 million Syrians. The United Nations now says that 12 million of them are homeless. It is the greatest humanitarian catastrophe since 1945, when the world blew apart. And you have about 5 million Syrians outside the country and Jordan, Iraq, Turkey, Lebanon, one of every two kids in the Lebanese public schools are Syrian refugees. You have about a million Syrians, 1.2 million in Northern Europe, Germany, Sweden, Finland, Netherlands. Uh, and you have seven million Syrians, homeless, displaced, bombed out of their homes inside the country. Mm -hmm. This is an urgent catastrophe. Let me ask you an ethical question. We have to deal with these at the Kennedy School and in life. Yeah. Is it right that we suspend all Syrian refugee admissions in the greatest crisis in 72 years? Well, thank you, Nick, for that question. Um, my impression, again, as a historian, 
Yes, we're having a very serious-minded discussion about security here on this panel. We have, we have experts on, on, on the topic. I, I, I'm very skeptical that this is actually about security. I just have my suspicions about it for the reasons I mentioned before. Um, it seems to me that this is part of a history of signaling who is wanted in this country and who is not wanted in this country. That isn't to deny that we have genuine security problems. It also strikes me that the most terrorist attacks that have happened in the United States and the greatest violence committed in the United States in the past, let's say, 10 years, right, been committed by uh, people who are not uh, Muslims and certainly not from those countries, right? We are not having a discussion about them. What I think is going on is that the Syrian refugees represent a group that the current administration is signaling as a matter of principle and policy and worldview, we reject the idea that the United States is in any ways indebted ethically uh, to helping these people. I wouldn't even use the word ethics in the context of what this administration is doing. So uh, that's my fear. My fear is that uh, the Syrian refugees are being turned away not because they pose a security risk, but because they are refugees and because it's a signal of what kind of country uh, we want to have, the people in this room want to have. 50% of our students are international, and I think this is part of what makes the, the, the school great. Mm -hmm. And currently, uh, we seem to have people in government who hold a worldview, among other things, of uh, a coming war between Christianity and the Muslim world. Uh, and these aren't the ramblings of someone on the internet. These are people very close to power or in power. So I'm afraid that we can't just isolate the question of security, as far as I can tell, historically speaking, from these broader concerns. So we're going to thank you, Moshe. <laughs> we're going to go to your questions in just a minute. But I think given what Moshe has just said, I, I want to ask the panel, whoever wants to comment on this, and we'll do it very briefly, the following question. David Miliband, who's the president of the International Rescue Committee in New York, it's our largest refugee organization, spoke at the Harvard commencement nearly two years ago, at our commencement, excuse me, the Kennedy School commencement. David reminded us that in every refugee crisis since World War II, when the United Nations establishes the number of people who need to be resettled, whatever that number is, the United States historically has always taken half if there are at least five million Syrians outside of their country, the United States has now taken in 12,500. We are nowhere close to our historical, under Republican and Democratic administrations, self-interested obligation to take in refugees. So as a matter of public policy for 2017, are we right to suspend refugee admissions, especially from the most damaged country in the world? I just ask anyone who wants to comment on that issue. Let me respond to that real fast. I think um, a couple of things. One, we know ISIS tries to infiltrate refugee camps. We know that. Um, we know that that is part of their deliberate strategy. We know that. We also know that when there has been uh, mass migration from jihadist conflict zones, the problems that we've seen in Europe over the long run uh, have developed in part because people have come from strife-torn areas and brought their beliefs and their, and their culture that led to that strife to the place where they are. It is a mistake, I think, to think of, I don't, I don't think I think, I know it is a mistake to think of the Muslim world as this big undifferentiated mass of people who hold common values and come from a common culture. That's just false. Um, what you have in Syria is an absolutely jihadist, torn place where a lot of, the, a lot of refugees are completely innocent men, women, and children, and some are also known as the jihadist losers of a conflict. And that's just a fact we have to deal with. And that is incredibly hard to sort through. I have been in rooms in Iraq with a person sitting as close from me to you educated at Oxford, spoke English far better than I do. I was, I could take grammar lessons from him. I mean, 
and he was the leader of the, lead, the world's most, at that time, significant suicide, female suicide bombing ring. And he recruited suicide bombers by raping them and shaming them into becoming suicide bombers. And this was a person educated in England. And, and that's the thing is we, we want the world to be in a place where there's these tiny few bad people and this big mass of really great people. And then it's easy to then say, well, how dare you exclude this big mass of really great people because you're terrified of these tiny few really bad people. But cultures are far more complex than that. And the concern that you have, if you actually had mass immigration from a jihadist conflict zone, it was a jihadist conflict zone for a reason. And the reason was beyond just the tiny few numbers of people. I saw that with my own eyes in Diyala province in Iraq. I spent so much time talking to tribal elders and leaders. And there was deep dysfunction there, deep dysfunction and deep suffering. And so my conclusion is that the compassionate thing, and again, I want to preface this by saying it is all so hard. It is all so hard. And there are so many perilous avenues that you can go down. But my conclusion to this is that the notion that increasing refugees from 10,000 to 20,000 from Syria or 50,000 or 100,000 is a drop in the ocean of suffering that is there. And that the compassionate thing, the truly compassionate thing, and the thing that would have been truly good for the world order is something that the American people, both sides of the aisle, flat out would not have supported. And that is maintaining a strong American presence in Iraq and intervening in a decisive way earlier in the Syrian conflict. And from that standpoint, I think that um, all of us who are looking out there, you know, our opinions matter and the way we express our political opinions matter in ways that we often can't foresee down the road. And when you say, well, we just can't be interventionist anymore. And then, you know, I, look, I was a critic of the Obama administration, a strong critic of the Obama, Obama administration, but I believe if he wanted to intervene in Syria, he couldn't have. I think there would have been a bipartisan rejection of that. Only Lindsey Graham and John McCain would have been right there with it, and it's hard to <laughs> charge in with three men into Syria. So, so I, that, that, that's, my, that's my brief response. Thank you. Um, we gotta go to student question for Gil. So from a, a very narrow standpoint also, policies that say be afraid, be very afraid, are not particularly good policies. When I was the police chief in Seattle, if I told everyone to be afraid and that you lived in a dangerous city and to help me define whether this is a safe city or not, it's like looking for the definition of a secure border. Everyone wants a secure border, no one can even begin to define it. So in, in our country, we really depend upon this, these relationships. The largest mosque in the Pacific Northwest is in Seattle. Every summer, the people in that mosque held a, uh, a picnic for the officers in that precinct uh, where, where the officers worked and protected them. You want that type of trust and that type of information. And these overarching policies that, that tell you to be very afraid. I wouldn't have lasted, I lasted nine years as a police chief. I wouldn't have lasted uh, a year as a police chief if I told everyone in that city to be afraid, be very afraid. Um, any policy is going to be at risk of being over-inclusive or under-inclusive. So the fact, so that doesn't get me anywhere about thinking about this executive order. Your goal is, if you, if, you know, if you decide that a group of countries are going to be out, that's clearly going to be over-inclusive. And that, but that, you know, lots of laws are over or policies are over-inclusive. The question is, is it over-inclusive? for the, the, the harm that we have, and are there means by which you can make it less draconian? And so, um, so this either or, which I think even my side and your side, we all have a tendency. I mean, one of the worst things that I think that may come out of it is that, you know, Democrats all think, well, we never can reform immigration or refugee programs anymore because that would mean excluding all refugees, right? We have to admit reforms have to happen. And so, one reason, one thing I think to think about is even if you would narrow it down to this pool of people, um, were there better ways to do this? 
not just the operations of the rollout. Technology, vetting, shared intelligence with our Muslim countries, um, uh, intelligence uh, internally here, all the different pieces that go into who gets to come into this country. And boy, I think I would feel a lot better, uh, let alone the long-term impacts, that we might actually get the person that we could conceivably be worried about through that than through a blanket ban. Final comment. Yeah, so uh, regarding the implementation, I think it's really interesting. So we talked a lot about the executive order itself, which at least to me on the, on the face of it uh, doesn't make a lot of sense uh, in, in dealing with these issues that, uh, that you raise. Um, but the implementation of it, as you pointed out, Gil, happening the way it did, uh, kind of agency, you know, agents not knowing exactly what they're supposed to do, uh, the speed in which it's done, that indicates to me, again, a sort of, I'm looking for the right word, a sort of mean-spiritedness or, or, or cruelty, so that it's not done out of, you know, the way David framed this, sort of, with, with regard to the tragic situation of these people, and it's actually done almost with a gleeful, chaotic joy, right? How miserable can we actually make these people at the airport? So let's say we, of course we have, security issues and we have potential threats and we might imagine that a two-year-old Syrian baby might grow up to become a terrorist someday, perhaps. What does that have to do with a couple of 85-year-old Iranian um, you know, people who have been living in this country who are detained at the airport and held for hours? What does that have to do with someone from one of these countries who is scheduled to go through heart surgery? Um, all of these cases uh, it seems to me any you know, border agent would know that the risk is very low, and yet they all seem to have been caught up in this, uh, in this dragnet. That's very worrying to me, because I also think it signals an attitude about these refugees and immigrants that is very different from our more hopeful one that we're suggesting here. And then final comment about borders and agents. And Gil knows more about this than I do, but I'll say something anyway. So the, <laughs> the history of this is very interesting. The thing about, board, about border agents um, is that only they can let you in the country. So you, this is something also worrying from a historical standpoint that we've seen, and we've seen judges all over the country basically telling the administration what you're doing is uh, illegal and unconstitutional. Uh, but then we see a gap between what the judges are saying and what is actually happen, happening at airports, right? And agents at the airports, you have to feel for them because they don't know who's in charge. They have an executive order, but then they have judges saying that the executive order is, is illegal. So what happens? In the meantime, the people that suffer are going to be the innocent people in transit who can't get in or are turned away. Maybe they've been living here for 10 years. They have jobs, uh, you know, a, a car, a house, etc. They become Americanized. Now they have to go, they have to go home. Uh, now, uh, the thing is, that with a situation in which an agency doesn't know which law or which order they're following, now, from a, now I'm getting really worried, historically. I'm getting worried that we are, it's not clear exactly who is in charge of policy making in this country, who is actually ruling on these issues, and whether the executive authority, right, the administration, is actually respecting the judiciary. And it's only been less than two weeks. So from historic, as a historian, I'm worried about that. So we're gonna to go to questions. Thank you, everyone.